Ed Mendel with the San Diego Union Tribune. Welcome, Ed. Paul Hosley, KCBS Radio. I'm sure many of you have heard his reports being filed as you're driving around in your cars. I know I do. Jason Leopold, Dow Jones Newswires. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. And to my right is Carrie Payton. She is with the Sacramento Bee. Welcome, everyone. As you know, this panel is about how did the media handle the energy crises? We all looked at the energy crises from our different perspectives. We've all certainly braced ourselves and heard about the fact that we were going to have all of these rolling blackouts and power outages. I worked for the media, but I now work for the State Department of Consumer Affairs, and it's our responsibility to get out all of the energy conservation messages. So we, along with everyone else, were trying to prepare some of the vulnerable populations for all of these blackouts that we heard were coming down the pike, um, both through official sources and through the media. Um, I'm sure that everyone else was at home gathering up their extra water, their flashlights and everything. However, something really strange happened on the way to all those blackouts. Just like me, all of you probably noticed that really they didn't materialize. We were told that we were going to have several blackouts probably each week, um, that we would all be affected by it, and it didn't materialize. What we are going to be covering and talking about in this panel was, is the credibility of the news media undermined when such an assumption is made that the worst prediction is going to happen, and then it doesn't happen, it proves to be false. Perhaps some of these distinguished folks up here on the panel can <laughs> shed some light on exactly what did happen. Um, this is going to be the structure of the panel. Each panel member is going to have a presentation to give, and then afterwards we can kind of grill them and question them on, you know, what did you say? What was your role? <coughs> And um, I can see that some of us are eager to get about the business of doing that. I'm going to start with Carrie Payton with the Sacramento Bee. Well, um, actually, I move this over here. Yeah. How's that? Is everybody hearing all right in back? Yeah. No, I'm I seeing no. Else. I think you uh oh. Just through. Well, sure I could also. Prepared. I can also try to boom through. Okay, have you, are you hearing me now? No. Nope. Now. Ah, that's better. Okay. I can hear you. All right. Yeah. Now we've got this hooked up. Um, well, you know, in a way, a lot of things happened. I wrote a story not too long ago where I described this, the predictions of blackouts this summer as you've all heard of self fulfilling prophecies. In some ways, this was a self negating prophecy. Um, the mere, it wasn't that the media got out there and said, we're going to have blackouts, we're going to have blackouts in a vacuum. Um, actually, the media was quoting people saying it, but even, even so. What, what happened first to kind of get everyone primed for this is we had two days of rolling blackouts in January, two days of rolling blackouts in March, two days of rolling blackouts in May, although one of them was quite short. And so we had a such and the, the January one was particularly counterintuitive because if you knew anything about energy, Normally, our usage in summer is about 50% higher on peak than our usage in the winter. So logically, we shouldn't have winter blackouts. I mean, we, and there's still finger pointing about why we had them. I think there are a lot of people are of the opinion that they were economic blackouts, that there were reasons that many plants were closed, that there were issues of payment fears in March and to some extent again in May, although by May it was, it was heating up. Um, but we had, so we had people who had experienced blackouts that, and had experienced them at a time that it was not expected that we'd have them. So there's, there was a mindset. Everybody started, I mean, people started saying we, we could have blackouts at least in the summer of 2000, and it might even have been earlier in 2000 that the very first forecast came out from the <coughs> Energy Commission saying, absolute worst case if the if we get the worst possible weather the worst possible number of plants on offline you know worst 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 of about five different contingencies it could start getting very tight um, 
so people knew there was some tightness and and I remember discussing with an editor where to put one of those stories and we said well you know it's it's like five contingencies got to be worse 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 let's put it on the metro front that's fine you know we we should report it but we don't want to needlessly scare people but by the time you came around to summer you had people who'd been through blackouts and you had uh, different consultants saying you know we might have 20 days where we have blackouts you might have 30 I think the the national uh, electric reliability organization came up with the most dire one which was I believe 260 hours or something in there um, and as each of these people made the forecasts the press reported it at the same time the governor and the state government had mobilized with these massive conservation messages um, that were going out to everyone and, and the con every time there was another blackout people began sounding the note conserve 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 and the conservation the level of conservation surprised a lot of people and I think the level of conservation was driven by the predictions of blackouts as well as all the things the government mobilized to do people realized they could do things that weren't that intrusive so I, th I think the mere fear of blackouts to a large extent drove the conservation we had people will say it was a mild winter a mild summer it was really around average um, we had one mild month we had a couple of slightly hotter than usual months um, but we didn't have the the ISO will say the independent system operator says well we didn't ever have really bad heat waves in the north and the south at the same time which overstresses the grid um, no one has really a lot of that subjective and anecdotal um, where, how much the weather really helped us but clearly conservation helped us clearly getting a couple of new plants online quickly helped us um, the breakdowns that seemed to plague the system all winter went away and I don't think anyone really knows why people have theories uh, that they were all done is one theory that the plants had been ridden so hard they broke down a lot in the winter but by summer uh, all those repairs were finished um, there are those who suggest some of those winter breakdowns were perhaps strategic and not quite just totally pure breakdowns um, I don't think we've got all the answers on that one yet um, so but there certainly we had we had all the generation that we expected online on a line for most of the summer instead of it falling out with these repeated maintenance problems and we had a little bit better rainfall pattern in the northwest which helped us get which helped make a little more hydro available <coughs> uh, but probably one of the very biggest factors was the level of conservation which was running a, a, around the clock kind of in the six to eight percent range most of the summer months um, and that's probably enough and, and I don't well I guess that's enough technical stuff I don't think it damaged the credibility of the media but who knows I mean maybe you can tell me better <laughs> than that um, I know when we wrote it we were careful to attribute it we were careful to say you know here are the people making the predictions I think at a couple of points we may even have have gone into more depth about why it might benefit some people to make the summer sound really bad but having had several days of blackouts yet we began to cover it as yes there's definitely a possibility we could have more I'm not sure I'd, I'd be really interested in some of your thoughts as to whether that hurt our credibility and I think with that well thank you Carrie I would be interested in their thoughts too but hold your thoughts until the end <laughs> until after everyone has had a chance to make a presentation <coughs> excuse me um, well, I'm gonna, I, I'd like to explain the, the type of reporting that I do first before um, getting into what happened. Um, I work for a real-time news service, and that's uh, Dow Jones Newswires is the uh, same company as the Wall Street Journal, except ours is, uh, our service is real-time news, real-time financial news. So uh, many, in many instances, we're putting headlines out on the wire and filling it with stories uh, as the news breaks. Uh, I don't think that the, uh, depending on who you talk to, specifically with me, if you were to ask the governor's office, oh, Jason Leopold put out a story and uh, there are no blackouts, well, they blame me for it, which they've done in many, many, <coughs> many stories, and I'm sure each one of these panelists can probably tell you about that. Um, I don't think that the media really is responsible 
or should it should be undermined for uh, for the failure or for no blackouts uh, materializing or or power prices, for example, just uh, declining. Uh, when these when these um, predictions were happening, the state was in a uh, was in a supply crunch. I mean, the uh, the generators would not sell to the utilities. The the utilities, Pacific Gas and Electric, Edison, weren't even credit worthy. Uh, that's partially part of the reason that we had blackouts in January. And during that time, there were so many power plants coming offline uh, that nobody really knew what was going to happen. So these experts the, at the Energy Commission and at the uh, independent system operator and even the governor's office, some f several advisors, predicted that, th that this, this would happen, much like you would predict the weather. I mean, and you, you, you may put out a story that tomorrow it's going to be rainy or it's going to snow, and uh, nothing happens, but you don't... You know, you don't see weather uh, meteorologists getting fired or being criticized. It, so it, it, that is, I'd like to compare it to that. And I think conservation did have, you know, a, uh, did in, uh, have a, an impact on um, blackouts not materializing. However, uh, you know, several, several different things happened. We were dealt a, a, a cooler summer. Um, and uh, the heat that was predicted didn't materialize as well. So I wouldn't blame the media for it, uh, and that's just, that's me. I, like I said, anyone in, in the governor's office or anyone connected certainly would because most of the people that were quoted were, you know, Governor Gray Davis himself and, and several others. Uh, I think that, uh, like I said, several things happened between January and now. The state signed enormous uh, uh, amounts of uh, electricity supply contracts that really did have an impact on bringing prices down and locking in uh, a significant amount of supply. Several power plants came online um, and you know I think that, that that's just a small you know that issue as far as blackouts is, is, is just a this big as, as far as you know what the real story is surrounding this and you know, there, there are several other things that, the, you know, that we've reported that, that haven't happened as well. Uh, like Jason at, at KCBS uh, San Francisco, we're an all-news radio station, and that's all we do is news, and it's real time, and it's up to the minute. And I would just first get this court set up. Uh, say... Not, not to say we're only as good as our sources, but we're only as good as our sources in a lot of instances. And these predictions kept coming down. And as Kerry said, they got uh, more intense. And you know, there's, it's going to be worse than we thought. And then another update, worse than we thought. And KCBS, we're the EAS station, we're the emergency alert uh, station in the Bay Area. So when there is an earthquake <coughs> or a rolling blackout or a huge fire or there are floods, the OES, the state of California, contacts us and says, get ready to roll. We need to use your station to alert the public. So they uh, were in touch with us to say, these are dire predictions. We could, could go 100 days or something, and we're going to get rolling blackouts throughout the entire summer. And yes, we reported that, but it was our obligation, I think, to warn the public to have them prepare. Here's how you prepare for when you get a rolling blackout. They're going to be with us for a long time. Here's some conservation tips. Here's what to do if your computer goes off or, uh, you know, during a power outage and you lose all of your stuff in your computer. So we, as a news and information station, felt an obligation to put that stuff out. Now, I would agree with Jason that it didn't materialize, but it wasn't our fault. We did have a cool summer. People did conserve. There were some power plants that came back on. Uh, and, and I would agree it's a minute part of the whole story, and we can get into that a little bit later. Uh, this was a highly, highly complex story to tell. Um, I think the public and a lot of people at our radio station and the newspapers thought that uh, electricity was something you go over to a wall and turn on your light switch and that's electricity, and that's about all we knew. We didn't know about the ISO, we didn't know about the grid, we didn't know what FERC was, we didn't know PUC, we didn't know price caps. 
all this stuff we kind of had to learn as we went. I mean, in, then at KCBS, we're all generalists, general assignment reporters. There's a few people that cover City Hall, but we had no energy desk. We had no uh, specialist in this field. So as we told the story as it came on, we were learning as well as the listeners. You get an expert on, explain the grid. What is the ISO? After a couple of three weeks of this, we started getting more comfortable with some of the uh, lingo and, uh, you know, what is a kilowatt as opposed to uh, a megawatt? How many homes does that supply? So I'm, I'm kind of going off topic here, but I think if we're up here trying to defend the, the media for some, you know, uh, overestimating uh, what this power crisis could be and all these rolling blackouts, uh, it wasn't us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, I'm uh, basically a uh, political reporter uh, based full-time here in Sacramento, but uh, beginning in uh, late December, uh, the editors decided that uh, I should focus uh, exclusively on electricity, and that's pretty much what I've done up until recently. I, I agree with these guys. Uh, the, the media, you know, has a lot to answer for, but uh, the blackout forecast is uh, definitely not one of them. The, um, uh, essentially what happened was that the uh, responsible, you know, knowledgeable people were expecting forecasts and, or uh, blackouts, and the, the, the I, I think one of the big drivers here was that the independent system operator, which operates the transmission grid in California, made a forecast early in the year and came up with a figure. I've forgotten what it was, but it was something like, we've looked everywhere we can look and we think we're going to be 3,000 megawatts short in the month of June. So. I think it was on this basis that the organization back on the East Coast, the North American Electricity Reliability Council, or whatever it was, that came up with a 250-hour uh, blackout forecast that was widely repeated, I think they based it on the ISO projection. The ISO was very cautious, however. They were just saying, look, we think we're going to be short. I think one of their people actually said, we think that on 34 days we could have a problem that could lead to blackouts but they never actually put an hour figure on it and were very indignant when some of the legislators said they were the ones who were forecasting the, uh, you know, the 200, hour, uh, 200 hours of blackouts. So I, just let me give you another example of how this <coughs> thing was not, clearly not driven by, by the media. The, uh, um, there was so much concern that there was legislation moving, for example, the, uh, uh, there were bills, I can think of one by Dutra, <laughs> that would have exempted uh, uh, refineries right. from blackouts. The PUC met and got into big, long hearings about how are we going to do this, who is going to be exempt. And um, uh, it, it, it was, and the governor, as, as you may recall, actually spent a considerable amount of time figuring out how are we going to warn people and came up with a stage thing that would happen over a couple of days, as I recall. But the thing that you can't forget here is that an electricity blackout is a very serious thing. On one of the first ones in San Diego, the lights went out in the intersection, there was a horrific auto collision. Someone was seriously injured. Businesses who are doing complicated processes that take hours or days, like manufacturing things, or making food, they lose their power, they lose their batch, whatever they were doing. They've got to start all over again. You can just go right down the list. This is a very, blackouts are, are a very serious thing. And uh, uh, so, I, you know, I, as I say, I, the, uh, you know, I've got my own quibbles with a lot of stuff that the media does, but uh, the media coverage of the, of the blackout forecast was, I've got no problem with it. Okay, now it's our time to question them. <laughs> I think I'll take this off. It might be easier for us to, well, maybe not. Oh, there we go. 
Well, I think we've got one question right here. In the prior panel, it was in here. A good argument was made that a major, major part of this conflict was the ideologically driven policy of free markets. And that that ideology ran all over everything, including policy analysis. Because some of this could have been predicted if they would have done some serious study. So my question is, as press, to what degree did you reveal the ideological mantra of free markets, free markets, free markets, as opposed to discuss two kilowatts here and two kilowatts there? So you could, you could focus on the pl this plant in Santa Cruz or down, or you could say, we got into this because of the ideology. And the reason that's so important to me is because, of course, this is the same free market ideology that we're now exporting to the whole world. So, so if we're going to have an argument about how we got into the power crisis, it applies to how we now distribute water in Bolivia. So it's a rather important issue. Anybody comment on how the free market ideology played into all this? Um, Ed, did I see a flicker in your eyes? <laughs> no? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, gee, that's a very big question. I, the, uh, uh, all, all I can tell you is that uh, the, uh, I don't know what the preceding panel did, but uh, f when this bill was passed back in 1996, electricity deregulation, it was, and, and here, you know, f I'll do the full mea culpa, the virtually ignored by the press. There were only a couple of reporters that paid much attention to it as all, as near as, near as I know. One of them was Rebecca Smith at the Mercury News has now moved on to sure. Wall Street Journal. And uh, I still remember I was at the Democratic Political Convention in Chicago and uh, because I thought it was nothing was going to happen at the end of the session. So I come back and ba-boom, I found out they've done several big things, including, including electrical deregulation. It was widely believed at the Capitol that the conference committee would not be able to put the political pieces together and produce the bill. In fact, if you talk to Harry Snyder, one of the leading consumer lobbyists for Consumer Union, I mean, to his chagrin, he will admit now, hey, I never paid any attention to that conference committee. There, were us, there was other stuff going on, and I didn't think they were going to be able to do it. But they did it. And one of the big criticisms now, I think, is that it was such a difficult political puzzle that they spent most of their time in deal-making. And I mean, there were even reports that in the conference committee, for example, the, uh, they'd come to a sticking point and uh, the legislature should tell the lobbyists from the contending special interest groups, hey, go out in the hallway and solve this and come back with a solution. We're moving on to the next point. And uh, so, I mean, in retrospect, it looks as if, it looks as if the whole thing was driven by politics with very little attention paid to policy. You can talk to people now who will say, and particularly, you know, I assume a lot of it's, you know, just kind of butt covering, but I mean, you. You can talk to, for example, lobbyists for PG&E who will say, you know, look, we wanted to phase this thing in. It was the big users, the business guys who were saying, the West is a wash in cheap electricity. California has prices that are 50% over the average. And a lot of people think that, you know, it was a overruns on nuclear plants. It was California invested heavily in the in renewables and the QFs, and that's a much more expensive form of power, at least at that point, than, a, you know, than it is now. And there were other reasons like that. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the business guys and some of the legislators will tell you the same thing. You know, look, we just wanted to do the business guys. We were thinking about phasing it in. But everybody, and back to your point about ideology, everybody thought that deregulation was such a good idea that the advocates for the consumers actually insisted that the residential people be in there. I mean, you know, this is what some of the people will tell you now. So, uh, I mean, it was just, a, it was out there. It was just sort of a global attitude. And the consumer groups themselves, you know, their lobbyists sat through the, you know, the famous Steve Peace death march when the conference committee was meeting till two or three in the morning for two weeks and finally kicked out the bill. And uh, uh, they didn't support it. But significantly, they didn't oppose it. And the result was that it went through the legislature, it kicked, the bill was kicked out on both floors, it went through the Senate 39 to nothing, it went through the Assembly 77 to nothing. And after the thing got out, Harry Snyder at Consumers Union is the guy who said, my God, what have we done? And wrote this big, long, impassioned letter 
to Governor Wilson saying, veto this thing. It's a turkey, it's a potential disaster, and it went down, you know, a long list of things. But uh, anyway, the bill was signed. So I guess it, it's a long answer, but I, my, I, I guess I'm just telling you, when this bill came out, everybody thought deregulation was a good idea. And now, of course, everyone is saying, hey, maybe not. And it, and it looks like we're still, it's still hard to figure what sort of a system we're going to emerge with when it comes out, you know, when this, you know, when everything shakes out. But it looks as if we're going to have a deregulated system of some kind, for sure, when it's all over. So. Thanks, Ed. That's an interesting yeah. historical perspective. Anyone else want to tackle that one, or do we want to go on to another question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I don't see any more questions out from the audience right now, but I've got one. My oh, okay. There's one right there. Uh, I just grabbed out of my briefcase uh, Kerry's article <coughs> on the PUC vote on Tuesday, and I'm just wondering about, you know, going from a physical challenge of keeping the lights on to the fiscal challenge facing the state and the general fund and all that, and, and the different alignments that seem to be shaping up, you know, with the PUC or with. Uh, Davis or with the treasurer Phil Angelinas and you know the Burton bill sitting on the, on the governor's desk, which uh, Bob Shear referred to last night in, in, uh, in a positive way. Um, you know the general fund health is something that concerns a lot of people, especially education groups. We're part of a press conference, I think, that had attended on uh, covered on Monday. Um, you know, could you comment on you know that phrase going forward, where you know where we're going with the state's fiscal health and the general fund uh, repayment for the 6.2 billion that's been spent to buy electricity. Well, if I knew where we were going, uh, <laughs> not not only would I have a really nice consulting job, but you know, everybody who wants to know where we we're going would like me a lot. Uh, I I don't know. But really, it's so hard to say. There right now, the governor has the governor and the state treasurer are very firm. They want these bonds done in the way that it was outlined under, a, under I think it was AB1X, but, but under 1X that was passed in early January. That was the piece of legislation that said, yes, the state can go, can jump in and buy electricity, which it had already done, interestingly enough. The, the DWR jumped in for the first time in December because things were looking really bad. The ISO just couldn't buy and these people knew each other and they said, hey, buy for us. Come on, get us off the hook. And it happened a couple times in December. It happened a little more in January. By January, the legislature was getting wind of it and said, wait a minute, you aren't authorized to do this. So they had to do something. Um, and I believe that legislation, I, I don't, I cover energy, but not the capital. So we've had an interesting sharing over the years of when I'm over there, when I'm not. And Ed could probably help with details. But I believe that that whole package said, yes, you can go buy energy. Yes, we'll fund it through bonds. Um, and there was some discussion at the time that the best way to structure the bonds might be what the PUC is advocating now, that is, with a payment stream that went first to the bondholders. The difficulty with that is the, the sticking point now, and, and even the people who bonding people will tell you, yes, that kind of bond generally gets the best interest rates. The trouble is there are contracts that were signed, you know, January, February, March, April, May, with the generators and marketers that said you will be <coughs> paid before bondholders. So the, the difficulty is the PUC and the people who don't like these contracts and the people who want us to go to FERC and say set these contracts aside or find that they're unreasonable, um, force <coughs> some renegotiations. Those people really like the idea of divorcing the contracts from the bonds. The rate agreement that's now that was in front of the PUC tied the two together. So we have we have a very strong minded governor and a fairly strong minded <coughs> treasurer saying it's going to be this way. And we have what appears to be an equally strong minded PUC saying, no, it's not. This is bad policy and and we don't like it. Um, and where that ends up, there I mean there's a couple of routes it could go. Governor could veto 18 double X. Uh, he could get uh, at least Jeff Law, Jeff um, Brown, and maybe other people to come back, take it up at the PUC again, w in the hope that some of the people who voted against it initially, now that they see 18 double X as a dead deal, will vote 
uh, for a rate agreement this time. Alternately, they could sit down with Lynch and those folks, try to come up with some kind of scaled back rate agreement that would still fill the provisions of or, or some key provisions of 1X while keeping the PUC happy with some kind of compromise, that could go forward. Um, there has been talk that they've looked into ways to see if they can issue the bonds without the PUC. Uh, so far, I'm not hearing any rumblings that that talk is successful. Um, failing that, we'll probably end up either at a special legislative session or back at the legislature in January revisiting either 1X or 18XX for something that will create the minimum number. Everybody agrees there's going to be lawsuits. So the trick is to create the minimum number of lawsuits that are, le that are likely to do the least damage to the time frame of issuing the bonds. Uh, that's, and, and then you can go way farther out and say that presumes we still need bonds and do we need as many as we originally needed and are there other options out there? Um, it's it's going to be fascinating. I would actually love to hear what some other people <coughs> think about where that one's going. <coughs> well, it's interesting that uh, this, the financial risk to the state right now is that it's uh, in danger of, had, of having its credit rating downgraded even further. Uh, Moody's, <coughs> which is a major credit rating uh, agency on Wall Street, uh, said indicated that if these bonds don't get sold and and the general fund is not repaid, California could find itself with a, uh, with a further downgrade in its ability to you know, access capital markets and loans would, it, it, it would either cost a heck of a lot of money, uh, meaning you know, very high interest, or uh, it won't be able to sell bonds um, because nobody will touch them. And I think the funny thing is that Edison right now is like just probably was just pulled out of bankruptcy and the state is like almost getting you know, into the situation that Southern California Edison is in. And I think that's just so ironic that the state has spent the money to keep the utility, uh, to, or rather to keep the lights on and, and help the utilities because they weren't able to buy uh, power. And now here, here we have the state in, in kind of the similar situation that uh, well, at least one of the utilities were in. But uh, I can tell you that you know I, I spoke to you know some folks in. in uh, the treasurer's office yesterday, and they said that you know, they they met with J.P. Morgan and Chase, which is one of the uh, uh, underwriters of the bond sale, and uh, you know, they're they're trying to and um, Lehman Brothers, which is another banking agency, and they're trying to uh, get an extension on, on repaying this this bridge loan that the state has taken out uh, earlier this year to kind of you know keep uh, keep the money flowing to purchase power. And that loan was supposed to be paid back with this bond sale, so you know we're already seeing the, the uh, we're already seeing the state in in, in a getting close to a severe financial crunch, and it's it's really as a, this bond sale really you know and, and the power situation is 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 responsible for that, and the thing with the PUC is that you know. Davis and Davis and Loretta Lynch, who is the president of the PUC, they had an they had an agreement. It was, uh, I don't think that Davis anticipated the PUC turning down uh, his request uh, or, or his uh, it, it, having this rate agreement approved. I, I don't think that they anticipated that uh, at all. And, uh, you know, the, bank, uh, the, the banks are telling uh, the administration, you have to have a plan C, D, and E. You can't just have a plan B because they're, you know, they're worried that uh, they're not going to get paid back. And uh, you know that these bonds aren't so obviously if they're not sold uh, next year. You know there's going to be a big hole in the budget. Anyone else to comment on that particular question? Ed? Oh sure, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? What the hell? Uh, I, I, my own view of this thing, for for uh, <coughs> whatever it's worth, is that essentially. What the PUC did this week was uh, try to put some leverage on the governor to get him to renegotiate the uh, long-term contracts. And um, the uh, uh, what what happened was uh, the when power was totally out of control back in January and February, and the state had stepped in and was buying power for the utility co 
customers. One of the ways, or the main way, they tried to get a grip on it was to get these long-term contracts. And the idea was that power would be lower than the market in the short run, but maybe a little over in the long run. It was, you know, the governor kept saying it was a trade-off. So they ended up with what is now, you know, estimates are 45, 45, you know, 45, 46 billion dollars worth of power through the end of the decade in long-term contracts. But the big fear now is that the contracts are going to be not just a little over the market, but way over the market. And, you know, the spot supposedly has dropped you know, there were reports that it was down around $30, you know, uh, uh, per, per megawatt hour in, in recent weeks. And the contracts, that, and, and it, this average is probably shaky, but it's the one the administration uses, are around, you know, like $69. So there, there, there's this, this is the way I see it. I mean, this is the political dynamic, and I may have it wrong, but this is the way I see it, that essentially the PUC, with strong support from Senator Burton and most of the legislature, block the rate agreement with the notion that this will put pressure on the administration to try to figure out a way to renegotiate these contracts and get California locked in either out from under them, you know, uh, to some degree, or at least locked into a lower rate over a period of time. So I think we're just going to see a little pushing and pulling and maneuvering and uh, and, uh, you know, who knows, maybe the administration, which so far, I mean, basically the governor and his, his top advisor, David Freeman, have vigorously defended the contract, saying they're the reason that power prices dropped this summer. And that, uh, you know, the state has an obligation. The contracts were obtained at a very dicey time. And, you know, we, we have to show good faith. You know, I, I don't know, they seem to intimate there's you know, like honor or something. You know, we cut the <laughs> deal and we got to stick with it. You know, it, that, that, that's somehow that's important. But so anyway, uh, for what it's worth, that's, that's how I see it. How it works out, uh, I have no clue. I, just don't know. I see more questions in the audience. But, but, but before I go to one more person, I've sensed with this last question a shift that's going on. This um, panel was supposed to be discussing, um, is the media responsible for misforecasting the blackouts? Obviously, all these panel members up here said <laughs> no, the media <laughs> is not responsible for misforecasting the blackouts. And perhaps this audience agrees with them and wants to move on to how do we solve this mess, this big problem now that we're in it, and these are the experts that have been studying it, um, and obviously they've got some history in it. How many people out there agree with the panel? I, I just want to see a show of hands that the media is not responsible for misforecasting. Can you put it in front of the camera? <laughs> right around there? <laughs> right <up here>. Please. <laughs> How many feel that the media is responsible and might have some questions? Oh, okay. We've We've got one really strong, two, a <laughs> couple of really strong people that well, feel that I they are. Sure. I don't think anybody disputes that there was evidence. Uh, that a lot of people <laughs> who, who knew thought there might be rolling blackouts and thought, you know, you could point to all the, this information, which Kerry talked about, that this could happen. Um, but once the press got that and went with it, that became the story. And the story was that there were going to be rolling blackouts. Not that there might be rolling blackouts. You didn't write in your story that uh, so-and-so said there are going to be rolling blackouts, but of course this may not all happen, because that kills your story. There is no story if there are no rolling blackouts. Mm -hmm. So you did what you could to show that the uh, degree of probability that there would be rolling blackouts was very high. And you did that to make the story. And you did that in such a way that you convinced the people of California that there were going to be rolling blackouts. Now, sure, you had the evidence. But you also had people who were saying, this may happen. But that wasn't what the public got from this. And so everybody was absolutely astonished when there were no rolling blackouts, even though the evidence was qualified that you were quoting from, but you didn't push that evidence because that killed the story. It's just like, if I can say one more thing, just sort of like the Gary Condit story. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're gonna go the there? Press, yeah. Right. The press was convinced 
<laughs> that Gary Condit knew something about Chandra Levy's disappearance. Otherwise, it wasn't a story. So you had to keep pursuing that. You had to keep pushing that. You had to keep finding that. So you managed to convince the public that Gary Condit was holding back on information. Now, there's no evidence for that. But the press, if you look at the question you were asked, always seems to want to go with the worst possible story, the worst possible situation, as being what probably happened, because that's what your job is as, as journalists, to be paranoid. Okay, well, <laughs> why don't we, with that, why don't we let them comment on whether or not the press felt compelled to um, say that there are going to be blackouts because it does make be make a better story. I will definitely not dispute the fact that somebody coming out with a statement saying there's be 250 hours of rolling blackouts this summer makes for a good story. But there's also an obligation of somebody saying there's going to be 250 hours of rolling blackouts this summer that we report it. And uh, like I said before, with the weather, you are for you are giving a prediction. So and so is saying, this is what's going to happen. This is what we we are predicting. And I could tell you from the stories that I that I've written, <coughs> excuse me, that it was a, it was just a prediction. The California Energy Commission has has forecast 250 hours of rolling blackouts this summer. Has forecast. Uh, depending on, I mean, obviously the public, you know, we want to get the message out to the public saying this is what could happen. But only when it happens is when you can report it after the fact. Uh, if, the, if there were blackouts this summer and it obviously everything materializes the, you know, as the press indicated that, you know, I would be amazed if every single thing that we said regarding the forecast of blackouts had materialized as it was reported. I would be amazed if that exactly, if that happened. The fact that nothing happened you know, is, is, is also amazing to me. But, uh, you know, we were getting these dire predictions from the state. And maybe the state was paranoid in the sense that they wanted to make sure that people would conserve. But, again, you know, when you get a, when you get a dire prediction or something like that, yes, it definitely makes a great story. It makes a much better story than the state's going to have one hour of rolling blackouts this summer. Uh, because that's probably a story I wouldn't have written. But, uh, you know, something at like 250 hours, well, that's like Ed was saying earlier, that, that's dangerous. That, that actually, uh, public safety becomes an issue at that point. And we are res I, I believe we are, you know, we are resp our responsibility is to report that because of it. You're making my point. Good. <laughs> I'm glad. I'll, I'll huh? Okay. I guess everybody's chomping at the bit to defend themselves. Here's Carrie. Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm willing to kick it around as a theoretical discussion. I think what changed the tenor of the reporting is not, because th these predictions were coming out early, and when we first got them, I, I, I remember our reporting was very skeptical. It's, you know, this one report says these things could happen. I think what changed the tenor of our reporting was the blackouts. At least it changed the tenor of mine. I mean, I had been covering energy for a while, not long enough to watch uh, 1890 go through the legislature, but before the, the, free m the market opened, before the ISO opened, I had started covering energy. And I sort of thought I had a little bit of grip of some of the institutions and how things worked and maybe even some of the underlying science, not a lot, but a little. Um, and when, when I first saw the predictions, they did seem so hedged, so you know, if this and this and this happens. And, and I remember writing stories that were pretty low key and got fairly um, moderate play. They weren't out there on the front page. But once we had blackouts, and particularly blackouts in January, at a time that it made no sense to have blackouts, I really had the sense of a reporter that I don't understand this anymore. I don't know what's going on. There's clearly stuff going on that I haven't got a grip on because there's no logical, rational reason for blackouts in January in California. Uh, we should have a surplus. So I probably did rely a little more on experts after that to say, hey, here's what could happen next. And in addition, I had the reality of, of readers who had seen a batch of blackouts who wanted to know how many more. So I think the, the whole 
um, mindset changed once we started having some blackouts. And I don't think it was so much an effort to hype the story as it as it hyped itself. Now there was there was interest in the administration, in, in the governor's office, in the Energy Commission, in pushing the message, conserve, conserve, conserve. So we had a lot of, of people um, in high places within the state and within the grid saying, hey, it could be really bad, you better conserve. And that fed itself. So anyway. I can co-sign to that. OK, we've also got a lot more questions, okay. so keep it brief. <laughs> Thanks for firing us up, by the way. Um, it, when people call the newsroom and say, I just hear that, that we're going to be rolling black ass for them. No, you heard there could be. We call that selective listening. Sometimes, and I'm not going to, sometimes you hear part of the story and you think that that's the whole story and you tell your neighbor, hey, did you hear on KCBS it's going to be months of, that happens. And did you hear that Gary Condit kidnapped Chandra Levy and killed yeah. her? <laughs> and, uh, and, I read it in the National Enquirer. And his story did hype itself. I mean, my God, we just heard there, there could be could be weeks of rolling blackouts, head for the hills, it's going to be a disaster. What we try to do is put that in context, get some industry analyst types or experts to say, well, how likely is this going to happen? And as these predictions kind of got revised, we have no shame in going on the air and saying we're getting revised predictions from the ISO. It looks like maybe there won't be that many. But when you get a fax into your newsroom that does actually say that could be or you don't even read the could be you read weeks and weeks of blackouts as a reporter you may get more excited reporting that kind of stuff and on the radio you, you get whoa three weeks four weeks five weeks of rolling. and a listener might hear that and say that they heard that as the gospel when in fact this was a prediction so I think the story did hype itself, uh, but again, I think we had an obligation to tell the public this could happen so they could prepare in the event it did. Well, I think a lot of people want to challenge us on that. You've had your hand up for quite a while, the lady back there in the uh, moss green suit. Question is, can you stand up a little? You're back in the back. Who do you trust on, on the blackout issue and on the fiscal issue? We have many um, experts that dispute one another. The controller is saying she can continue to finance the general fund through uh, revenue anticipation notes. The treasurer is saying, no, we're going to go bankrupt. Who do you trust? Where are your credible sources? That's very interesting because that's something I wanted to actually touch on before with the blackouts. One of, the, one of the criticisms that I have of the coverage during the past year has been that all of the information that we've been reporting uh, has, has come from uh, administration officials, they, the energy advisors, if you will. Uh, these are not experts. These are, not, these are policy experts. These are not people that have worked in the energy industry or the field or, or really have any idea what the heck they're saying. Um, and, I, and I'm talking specifically in the governor's office, and even so, even at the PUC. I mean, somebody like the uh, like Loretta Lynch, she does not have a a uh, an energy background. Okay, this is not somebody that uh, that is an expert, in my opinion, in the f in in the field. You know, she makes dis policy decisions, uh, and I think that part of the problem is that we have not really gotten out in the field in the trenches to uh, to dispute what anybody else is sa what anybody else is saying that's my own criticism of the coverage that everything has come out from Governor Gray Davis says there's going to be this and we report it and there's nothing there's nobody in there saying otherwise there's why because well you know there's this problem between the generators and the governor and and one side is saying it so how could you believe them it's 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 really funny because it, there's press releases coming out uh, consistently from that office, um, and what are you supposed to do? You you've you've got to report it, but then you you know there's also you want to doubt it, um, and then you know somebody like Kathleen Connell just to get to your your other uh, point, she's got an agenda likely you know, but at the same time there's there there are things that she says that are that are fact, it's the fact, whether or not she has an agenda. My sources, as far as the energy, because I deal with, with Wall Street and, and, and the money, um, and you know, how this affects the market, you know, how the mar anything that moves the market, and this energy situation has certainly you know, had an impact on the market. And my sources are people um, at uh, you know, major banks like Merrill Lynch, uh, 
JP Morgan, people who analyze, who, who are like utility energy analysts. And I'll tell you, you know, there are many times when, uh, when somebody in the, in, in, in the administration will come out with something and, and, and say something off the cuff and it's reported and these people are saying, well, what the heck are they talking about? Where did they get this from? They don't know, they don't know what's going on. And uh, so a lot, of, a lot of the sources that I depend on, you know, I'll report what they're saying, but you know, at the same time, I, I, I try to at least get some of the experts that actually you know, do that for a living. And, and I don't care if there's a dispute between you know, the generators, these Texas-based generators are gouging California. I don't care about that. You know, the facts are the facts. You know, is this going to happen or is it not going to happen? It it's a, it's really is a major criticism because I think that every, all the coverage is just based solely you know, on, uh, on, on statements that are made over there. And, and why these guys are, the, you know, are taken as the experts, I have no idea. I think as we get further along in this, as Ed and, and Kerry, you know, they are now energy uh, specific reporters and you guys can spot some of this stuff now that maybe eight months ago you, you didn't know it was hogwash, but now you can kind of see because you've immersed yourself in the coverage. And I think, you know, not to give us a, uh, an excuse here, but again, we're still learning. This is a beat that's fresh to a lot of people. It's not like the crime beat. Crime's been happening forever. We kind of know about crime. We, we know about finance. Uh, energy was, was really a, a, a new deal. So I'm not asking for a break, but that may be some of it. Well, it sounds like some of the media up here are saying that they were just as duped as the public. And sometimes that does happen with the learning curve. Um, you've had your hand up for a long time, sir. What is your... Oh, I'd like to piggyback that last question about sources, and I really like what you had to say about going to a source that's just a titular source, and maybe a totally stupid source, new guy in office somewhere, only because of the office, the media go to that person. Never do they say, this guy has spent 47 years of his life being as stupid as I am. <laughs> I'm a constant listener of KCBS. And I was astounded during the crisis, not you're doing, Paul, obviously, that we KCBS <laughs> actually found a guy in the ISO, I never heard of the ISO, who probably, by the head guys at the ISO, was pushed forward, you deal with these meddling media guys. And every morning, this guy from an outfit I never heard of was bowed to and salaamed by the KCBS News as the great expert. Wow. And it seemed to me, just as you use the word the public, and you never say 250 different million people, or you use the word the media, use the word government, and you never say 10 or 20 million people throughout the length and breadth of it. All you guys use the word the state and never say tens of thousands of different people with different ideas. So you pick some flunky in the ISO, <laughs> and he is the state of California. Is that responsible reporting? Paul, I'm going to let you answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> he was, uh, it's Pat Dorenson, I'm sure, who you were talking about. Oh, a nice voice. Yeah, good, good talk. <laughs> uh, they loved him. And he left to, now he's working for the other side now. So near it. No, yeah, he's working for one of the power companies. Uh, you know, that, that's what you get. They kept us at arm's length from the manager of the ISO. I mean, he was the spokesman, and he was our contact when they were rolling back us. He would call us because he needed to get the information out quick, and he knew that we could reach a lot of people uh, in, in a hurry. Um, he was the, the only guy that we could talk to, and he had good information as far as the blackouts, and that's the only place we could go. I mean, the ISO controlled when we were gonna go into a rolling blackout. We went right to the source. He was the guy, and if you know if that wasn't to your liking, I'm sorry, but that's the only guy we could go to. Was and it a mistake? No, it wasn't a mistake. We're, we're there to get the information right away. Rolling blackout happens, two minutes later, we got out on the air, we're telling you that your power is gonna it's out, or it's going to be out, and uh, your stuff in your freezer is going to melt, and uh, you know your air conditioner is not going to be on when you get home, and that was our obligation to try to, to warn people of that. And you know, he was our guy; we had to go to him. 
Okay, we will um, take a couple of other questions. We, we have a question from a, a gentleman in the front who's had his hand up for quite some time as well. Yeah, uh, so for me, the um, issue of credibility isn't so much what was said around the blackouts. I mean, if I were in your shoes, I might have said something like this. Can people hear him back there? Yeah. Okay, yes, yeah. it is. Uh, but it's, it's kind of what doesn't get said, <clears throat> and it's what doesn't get said in a bigger way. Uh, let me get back to what Ed Mendel was talking about in terms of not covering the original legislation that deregulated things. Uh, now, that was a huge story. I mean, that was a major change. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that stuff doesn't get covered because it's boring, because it's economic, because it doesn't sell newspapers, because it doesn't hook listeners, because it takes another level of thought and sophistication, because it's difficult to understand, because there's a whole history of describing it and discussing it. I mean, that doesn't get covered. What does get covered is the stuff that, well, like the gentleman behind me, sells newspapers, it hooks people. It's the, the tradition of yellow journalism. It's the tradition of ambulance chasing. Uh, and that stuff is juicy. So it is, it's kind of watching the media miss some of the really big stories that come along and then jump in. And you know, it, it, I mean, it's okay to be wrong about stuff. But it's, it's the enthusiasm with which the media jumps in on this alarmist stuff and the kind of benign neglect it has to the larger and more difficult issues. That's for me where the credibility comes. Okay, Carrie, that was more of a statement than a question, but Carrie wants to respond to it. It's a challenge. Well, and it's a challenge that, that goes both ways. I have never met a reporter who said, oh, I want to go do this story because it will sell more papers. I mean, we really don't actually think that way. But our bosses do. I mean, our editors, <laughs> when we're doing assignments, they're, they're not thinking in terms of street sales anymore because street sales aren't that big a deal. But they do readership surveys. They have an awareness of what people pay attention to. Um, and, you know, reporters are individuals. They gravitate toward different things. There are reporters who love, you know, the breaking story, whatever it is, the, the crime, the murder, the scandal, the blackout. But there are a lot of reporters, there are a lot of beat reporters who love exactly what you described, going into depth on an issue, looking at the pros and cons, thinking it through, talking to the people who think it through, and look where we're going in the broader scope of things. Those have to get past the editors who will want to see it in the paper. And there has to be an audience for them. And I think it's a two-way thing. I mean, if you look on the net, if you look at um, progressive magazines, if you, I mean, there are venues out there for writing like that. Their circulations are not large. I mean, I want to write stories like that, but I've got to have an audience for them. You know, I need people to want to read it. I need people to not be bored with it. I need people to you know, sit down at the breakfast table and say, you know, yeah, I really have a half hour to think about the big picture here, not, you know, hey, I want to see the headlines and drink my coffee and get to work. Um, it's not a one-way thing. If, it, if, if Carrie Payton could decide what to write and make you read it, <laughs> um, it would be a little different than if Carrie Payton knew she was, si you know, I know you're there at the breakfast table and I've got to pretty high up in that story tell you why you should care. You're going to move on to the next story. Um, so I think that the, there's an audience responsibility there, too. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that puts it into entertainment. Uh, no. Well, to some extent it does. It's crowd-pleasing. It's public it's service well, with an awareness no, no, of what your public but it, is. But, it, but, it, but it's where this matter of credibility comes in. Yeah. That if, um, uh, the, the, the extent to which credibility is more than crowd pleasing, and I understand the pressures, by the way. I mean, I'm in media also, so I really understand the pressures to sell things and to move things out. Uh, it's just that there's something, and it's not even an accusation, there's something just built into the mass media that pushes one toward a certain kind of uh, attitude and emphasizes certain things and de emphasizes mm -hmm. other things. And it goes beyond personal blank, it's just built in there. Good points are being made here today. Um, the lady there in the blue, you kept having your hand up. It's not up at the yeah, moment. But the front seat said a lot of what I had to say. Now, we've got print media here. We don't have anybody from the TV stations. And when we're talking about credibility, I think that when you have somebody breathlessly coming on at the 5 o'clock news saying, 
we're going to have a blackout, or there's that helicopter over Elk Grove at the intersection showing all this truck. This creates the alarmist thing. I'm an education professor, and last spring, my, I had to spend a lot of time in middle schools and high schools in Central Valley. And the principal would come over the intercom. In the next 10 minutes, we're going to have a blackout. Turn off your computers. Turn off your machines. And it created this, and then the blackout didn't happen, by the way. <laughs> when the prediction happened, though, what happened? Parents would suddenly come to the schools, even high schools, to take their kids home because the attitude was, they're not going to be safe in the high school, but there isn't any power. So when we're talking about all of this kind of information, where is the responsibility? Yes, you folks do have a responsibility to get us information to keep us safe. But again, it, it has to be balanced. And you have to realize that most people aren't going to care about the analysis, aren't going to care about the Senate bill, aren't going to care about the finances. Do I have food rotting in my refrigerator? Am I going to have to suddenly reset my water and microwave and, and all this stuff when I get home? And the alarm clock, I'm late to work because I've got to re I mean, it's just all these practical things. So really, then, you're kind of um, agreeing with what Carrie just said, that she needs to tell you the information that you that hits closest to home to you up front before the analysis is, is talked about, the things that are going to affect your life. Right, but in a non-alarmist way, I think would be beneficial. Yeah. Okay. Response on all that. You know, as, as a real-time news reporter, I, I, I'm not television, but I, I do want to address uh, one thing that you said. You know, I can give you many different examples of when the independent system operator who is responsible for maintaining reliability on the grid has issued a statement uh, saying that blackouts will happen in 15 minutes because we are a thousand megawatts short and again as a as a uh, real-time news reporter I have to put that out on the w on the wire Suddenly, 15 minutes later, miraculously, a thousand megawatts appear someplace, <laughs> and they call and they've called back that state quote stage three emergency. Now, th these these emergencies that they have set are, uh, you know, are are basically a stage three means blackouts are imminent. They're going to happen. It's just a matter of time. So uh, there have been many many circumstances this this past summer and and before that when. I mean, I don't know what the reason is. The, the, one of the problems with the, with the power crisis is that there has been so much secrecy. There have been, s there's so much information that we, as reporters, you know, I, I spent two weeks on one story just to get, you know, a crumble of something to tell people that, you know, the ISO has been uh, ordering power plants to reduce, you know, output, uh, rather than getting arcane with you. Uh, just to let you know, there's there's a lot of things that are happening that that we you know that we know about, but we can't get anybody to you know to really confirm. And and I don't mean to digress here, but that that has been one of the major challenges for us is that this is the reason that the state is involved in this is because this has become so political. Uh, this is not just an it is not just a you know an, a, an energy situation where. We have a, a utilities going bankrupt. This has become, you know, major policy, major, you know, policy issues. Uh, re-elections are, you know, people are, are going to lose their jobs over it or not get re-elected. So a lot of people don't, you know, don't want, a lot of people that are, uh, that are, you know, uh, the experts don't want their names attached to anything. And they'll, they'll tell you things. And you know what? I report things as, I, I report unnamed sources uh, in my stories. And, um, and I'll tell you, there, there have been many times, like, for example, like with the ISO, there's, you know, 10,000 megawatts offline, but there's nobody there to really get their name attached to it. Um, but you know what? We know it is because you can see it. And I, I, I can't, you know, try to illustrate that anymore, but there's th that's been one of the, the big problems with this is, you know, is, is the fact that nobody wants to say anything uh, other than, you know, there's going to be 250 blackouts. Ooh, everybody's conserving, yay. Now that's some interesting, intriguing inside information. Um, we've got some other questions. How about you, sir? There's been a lot of stories about biological terrorism in recent weeks. Uh, if, if it doesn't happen, will 
will then you be accused of hiding. I don't report on that, so I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but but in, in general, we are being faced with a new situation, yet another situation, where people are making dire predictions. Um, since you happen to be the emergency radio station, KCBS, Paul, I'll let you handle that. Re, you know, re, rephrase the question. What are you, what are you after? It, it's somewhat analogous. If you report on biological terrorism and it doesn't happen, it'll be like reporting on blackouts, which didn't happen, and then you'll be accused of piping. But if you don't report on them and it does happen, you will have been remiss in your job. So it seems to me it's rather unfair to accuse you of hyping something when you've already been given the information, this could happen. It seems that's your obligation. Well, once again, you know, in this climate, after the terror attacks, everybody's doing a what if this could happen, this scenario, the, and again, we have to report that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, I, I don't know, I mean, we, we got to do it. If we don't do it, we're remiss. Uh, if it happens, if we didn't predict that the World Trade Center would get hit by airplanes, uh, we didn't know that in advance, so we couldn't hype it, no. Um. <laughs> you know, the, one of the things is that it, it, it is a re like the, the, the terrorism or the biological uh, terrorism, it's a threat. It's a real threat. Blackouts were a real threat to California this year. The fact that it didn't happen, we're lucky. You consider yourself lucky, but don't, you know, I mean, unless you want it to happen, or God damn it, where was this biological terrorism? I've been waiting for it. I mean, it's a threat. It's, it's, we're not saying that, you know, you should go out and buy gas masks or, you know, buy uh, stock in Duracell, you know. Uh, it's, it, it, we're just reporting the fact that, you know what, like Kerry said, in January, the state had two days of rolling blackouts. And it, it, it's something that could happen again. And, and, and you should be aware of that. And, and I think it's just, you know, cut and dry, just like that. Oh, um, Carrie, if, if you make it quick, because we got a few more questions before the end. Okay, I'll make it real quick, but I'm, I'm fascinated with how the media has been responding to uh, the World Trade Center disaster. <laughs> and I was fortunate enough to be at a friend's house over the weekend who gets the New York Times and looked at the Saturday and Sunday New York Times, and they have full sections just on this. Um, so I want to ask you to do something with hands, um, because you could read an hour, two hours, three hours a day of the foreign policy decisions that got us here, the ways we might get out, the different ideas for getting out. Um, so let me start, and I want you to put your hands up. What's your appetite for reading explanation <coughs> and thought and ideas for what happens next? And I want to start with 15 minutes. How many would read 15 minutes a day? Just let's see hands. How many would read half an hour a day? Just leave your hands up. How, yeah, you. just how many would read an hour a day? How many would read two hours a day? Okay, thanks. I'd like to know the same question, though, with television. I know some people, my husband in particular, he's got CNN on 24-7 when he's at home. I mean, he stays glued to the screen. How many would view, you know, um, a half an hour's worth of TV? Um, two hours worth of TV. Okay, the hands go down. How about zero TV? Zero TV, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Interesting. Um, the young woman right there in the purple? Um, just following up on what the last gentleman said, I think that um, if the reverse had happened and he had had all sorts of blackouts this summer and the media hadn't covered it, we would have been saying, well, why weren't we warned about this? Where was the media? So I think the media, you know, you had officials, you know, you know supposedly um, good sources from, from the government um, telling you there would be, or there was a good possibility we could have blackouts, the media had to cover that. Um, but going back to the beginning of when this whole thing started, who was saying, you know, were there uh, alternate opinions covered? And it seems like there were consumer groups way back at the beginning of the summer saying, well, we don't really have a supply crisis. This is um, all a hoax. This is market manipulation is what's going on. 
were they proved right? And were there balanced sources and were you um, re reporting on what these other sources were saying? Absolutely. In fact, in 1999, the Energy Commission uh, had put out a report, you know, warning that, uh, you know, California could face uh, several days, several hours of rolling blackouts. They really were trying to uh, point out that the, the way that deregulation is being phased in has the, had the potential of, uh, you know, of, of, of blackouts. And there were warnings. In fact, I think the San Francisco Chronicle uh, you know, wrote a, uh, Rebecca Smith, I believe, when she was at, at the Chronicle, had reported that. Um, and it, it, she's at the Wall Street Journal now. But there's, you know, there were, there were warnings beforehand. The fact is that they really weren't covered. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, um, it's a story that wasn't covered. But then the consumer groups, well, you know, it, it's interesting. We, you, you do want to cover what they say but they too have an agenda and you have to be very cautious because why are they saying this? You know, there, there's a fine line between propaganda and, uh, you know, and, and fact. And the consumer groups really don't have, um, you know, strong evidence, in, in, in my opinion, that they have been able to present other than, you know, statements. And I, and I know that there, there's representatives from some consumer groups here, I believe. but. You know, with regard to generators, you know, uh, this this was this was a hoax. It, it's it was not a hoax. You know, there they there truly was a supply problem in California. There truly was a threat of blackouts, and uh, you know, and 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 I think that the you know we did cover both sides of it. You know, because you do want to have a balanced story in a sense where you have, you know, the experts saying this, but then somebody else saying, well, wait a minute. You know, there is, that's something that you want to present. We've got another five minutes. I'll try to get in. Um, why don't we just try to get in some quick questions and responses, because I know that there were other hands up. Anybody else? No? Wow. Okay. I thought, okay. Well, I just, I'm a little uncomfortable with the way that we're sort of doing the good guy, bad guy thing. Um, I think that a lot of the people attending today are sources for you guys. And if we didn't help you tell the story in a balanced way, we didn't do our job. And I think you're trying to do the best you can with a difficult set of circumstances this past year. And um, I represent the Office of Right Care Advocates, and if we weren't helpful to you in getting analysis quickly, we didn't do our job. So instead of making the, I don't know that we're on opposite sides of this, and that was kind of what I needed. Could, could I ask you a question? I, I'm just curious, uh, harking back to the question from the, the previous question, were you aware of anyone who was actually challenging the forecast of blackouts or saying that these guys are wrong, that there's no reason to believe that there will be blackouts? Well, you know, we tend to have all these really smart analysts on my team, mm -hmm. and they're paying attention to all of this. So with the 130 people you have in our office, there's probably 30 that think the sky is falling and 30 that think maybe not. Um, but what I'm suggesting is that you should be talking to both of the folks on our, our on either side of that debate for us. So, um, I think that's the more important lesson in this window. Yeah, is yeah that I, I, you know, I'm, I'm frankly puzzled about whether there were really people out there who were challenging the forecast of blackouts or whether we just simply weren't covering them. You know, I'm, I'm really unaware of any, frankly. Yeah. We tend to be on our end. We yeah. tend to be more cautious yeah. and much more thoughtful. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is you guys needed to know today yeah. that we weren't ready. Interesting. Um, right there in the uh, maroon top. Um, in retrospect, do you feel that it is more important now to be lower in public opinion, perhaps, and but still have prepared the public in case the blackouts had happened, or would you? have preferred not to have covered the blackout so intensively and have them not pan out. Do you feel that the preparation for the public was more important than public opinion now? I say absolutely because if we didn't when the public and the blackouts happened and you know chaos ensued again we would have been blamed for not alerting the public. Uh, we do this all the time but 
tsunami warnings, uh, uh, flood warnings, uh, big weather system coming in, batten down the hatches, uh, high wind warning on the Golden Gate Bridge, don't drive. I mean, this is what we do, and if it doesn't quite blow 60 knots and it blows 30, well, that's okay. A revised forecast came in, it's not as windy. A revised blackout forecast came in, we didn't have them, so it, 